All right. Thanks, Nathan. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and uh, want to say thanks for joining us in this 14th, I think if we count correctly, 14th virtual history uh, Friday afternoon lunch talk. Um, in partnership with Baltimore Heritage and the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. Um, today, we've got Charlie Duff uh, back, a local historian Charlie Duff, and I will bet uh, I will bet a sandwich that almost everybody on this call has heard Charlie both in person and uh, 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 virtually now. Um, uh, but before I introduce Charlie, let me just say that we've got two more programs. Let me announce the next two. Next week, we've got uh, a gentleman, Tim Almaguer, talking about Patterson Park and the Olmstead uh, influences there. So that should be pretty cool. Um, uh, Tim wrote a book on it, so he kind of knows what he's talking about. And then uh, the week after that, we've got uh, architect Leon Bridges, uh, who has been doing fantastic work in Baltimore for decades um, to share some of his experiences, <coughs> excuse me, over, uh, over many, many years. So come on out for those. Um, for all of you who have made a voluntary contribution of whatever amount for this, uh, I can say on behalf of the Architecture Foundation and Baltimore Heritage, thank you sincerely. Final word uh, housekeeping wise is if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A box, the little, uh, little toggle box down at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to them as soon as or as many as we can at the end. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Charlie, um, who is going to talk about uh, infra, uh, uh, work that he's done and put together from his book, North Atlantic Cities. Uh, but anybody who has uh, been around Charlie for any amount of time knows, A, that that, that book is great, um, and it took years of research to put together. But I, I think it really is a lifetime of thinking and studying and working and influencing cities that went into that book. And I personally am quite excited to, uh, to hear this little uh, snippet part uh, of what Charlie has accumulated over the last uh, many, many years of, of critically thinking about American cities or cities maybe worldwide. All right, with that, Charlie, we are all yours. Well, thanks. I, I wish we could stay all yours. You say much better things about me than ever I could say about myself, and that's great. Um, and for those of you who don't know, absolutely the most delightful part of my research in writing this book called The North Atlantic Cities was what we call John's and Charlie's Excellent Adventure. 1,100 miles, four days, looking at cities of the Ohio Valley, which are the westernmost row house cities in the United States. Johns Hopkins, driver extraordinaire, companion extraordinaire. You could write a book called Travels with Charlie. And uh, I would just call it Johns and Charlie's Excellent Adventure. So great fun. Um, here I get the right to share my screen. And as I think you're probably tired of hearing I've written this book called The North Atlantic Cities, which argues that there is a group of cities that you can call the North Atlantic Cities if you're so inclined, and I frankly hope you will. Um, all right. And there are a lot of stories in the overall story of the North Atlantic Cities. You know, I found myself following 20 or so cities for more than 400 years. And these cities had a lot of adventures, all kinds of people doing all kinds of things. And our ancestors who lived in the North Atlantic cities, cities like Baltimore, London, Amsterdam, Boston, New York, Manchester and Birmingham, Glasgow, these are the North Atlantic cities. And our ancestors there were and have been and still are uncommonly inventive. They're always getting themselves into scrapes and then getting themselves out of it. It's a lot like a novel. It's a lot like War and Peace, actually, except I'm not quite as good as Tolstoy. But uh, one of the things that the North Atlantic cities and their people invented was what we think of as downtown. That's one of the stories. Um, for those of you who are keeping score, I think it's in chapter five. But the invention of downtown is a big thing that all the North Atlantic cities collaborate on and nobody else has a, any hand in it. Let's turn the clock back to an autumn night in 1666 in London, when a baker's apprentice went to bed a little too early without banking the fire properly. The bakery caught fire, 
the Lord Mayor of London dithered in his response, and over the next three days, 80% of the old city of London burnt down. 80,000 people were made homeless. 14,000 houses were destroyed. St. Paul's Cathedral was burned. Everything you see in pink on this map was burned in the Great Fire of London in 1666. And it destroyed all of the business parts of London, destroyed the Royal Exchange, destroyed the Guild Hall, the City Hall, destroyed 42 halls of individual guilds, destroyed St. Paul's Cathedral, and it destroyed the houses of 14,000 families. Big mass, the Great Fire of London. Well, fast forward to a February night in 1904 in Baltimore, Maryland. This is a picture of the beginning of the Great Fire of Baltimore, 1904. It's a Sunday morning in February, it's cold. The warehouse of the John E. Hurston Company has just exploded in the background. While the firemen were fighting the fire, the building exploded. They're still not sure why, a smoke explosion, whatever that was. Uh, at any rate, Baltimore, downtown Baltimore, burned for the next 36 hours. And at the end, it looked like this. It was as devastating in acreage and in value as the Great Fire of London in 1666. But there was one big difference. The London Fire of 1666 destroyed 14,000 houses and made 80,000 people homeless. The Great Baltimore Fire of 1904 did not destroy a single house and not one person was made homeless by the Great Baltimore Fire. What on earth had changed between London in 1666 and Baltimore in 1904? What had changed was that the centers of cities in the North Atlantic world had become new kinds of places. They had become central business districts. Central business districts were an invention of the North Atlantic cities and they were invented We'll find out when, but let's just say sometime between 1666 and 1904. What is a central business district? It's a place where thousands, often tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people go to work every day, like Wall Street here in this photograph from the 1920s. But a central business district is also a place that is pin drop quiet on weekends and during the evenings and at night. Because even though tens and hundreds of thousands of people work in a central business district, nobody lives there. This is Wall Street on a Sunday or a Saturday in the 1920s. And it's quite, quite empty, uh, very different and very typical. Uh, and it was Americans who came up with what is the normal phrase for what a central business district is. Very few people speak of the central business district. We call it what New Yorkers began to call it, downtown. Downtown is where you go to work. Uptown is where you live. Downtown is an invention, a part of town where nobody lives and tons of people work. Downtowns as we know them did not exist in 1666. Even the biggest city in the North Atlantic world, London, did not have what we think of as a downtown. By 1904, every city in the North Atlantic world had a downtown, and you could burn down the whole center of a major city without making anybody homeless, as we did in Baltimore in 1904. Downtown, Petula Clark writes this song. Well, how did this happen? And why did it happen in the North Atlantic cities and nowhere else? It never happened in Paris and Berlin and Vienna. It never happened in Rome and Florence. Uh, it happened only in basically Great Britain and the United States. That's where downtown the central business district was invented. Why did it happen? Here's the story. First thing that happened 
was that the United States grew dramatically in the first couple of decades of the 19th century. On the left is a map of the United States in 1790. All the states are coastal states. The United States doesn't go inland yet in 1790. On the right is a map of the United States in 1820. And you'll see that it includes places like Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri, and Ohio. These are about the most productive agricultural areas in the world. And they all came into cultivation in the United States between 1790 and 1820. This meant that America all of a sudden was growing much, much, much more food than Americans could eat. Much more food even than they could feed to cattle and then eat the cattle. America became a country that needed to export what it could grow and it needed to export an awful, awful lot of it. Fortunately, there were people who wanted to buy it and they had the money to pay for it because on the other side of the ocean, in England, whoops, whoops, our English cousins were inventing the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution put millions of people to work for the first time in human history, not growing food. It was the first time in human history that a majority of the workforce was making things and not growing things, and it was happening in England. All of these people needed to be fed, and England couldn't feed them all. And they were making things that earned profits that allowed England to pay for the food to feed its industrial workforces. Uh, the great cotton and wool making cities of the north of England uh, were staffed largely by women. Uh, the great iron making and steel making cities of England were staffed largely by men and barely men at that. But they all had one thing in common. They were making things, they were not growing things, and they were eating food that had been grown by somebody else often by us. Well, how did this, how did food get from us to them? And how did manufactured goods get from them to us? At the beginning of the 19th century, it wasn't easy because the seas were not free in the early 19th century. There was a global war going on between England and France. Here's the Battle of Trafalgar. And that's not the kind of thing you would want to get caught in the middle of if you were just trying to carry wheat over to Europe or bring cloth back to America. So for the first 15 years of the 19th century, trade was sluggish. And if you wanted to carry things from one part of the world to the other, well, if you were trading for the, with the French, the British would try to capture you. If you were trading with the British, the French would try to capture you. And so you didn't want to be captured by anybody what you needed was the fastest thing on the water, and that was the making of Baltimore, because our ancestors built the fastest things on the water, the Baltimore Clippers. They were fast enough to outrun either the British or the French, and they made it possible for Baltimoreans to trade at a time when trade was very, very dangerous. The downside, however, of the Baltimore Clipper, and it was very severe, was that the Baltimore Clipper was small and it didn't carry much. So it was a great vessel for wartime when you had to elude capture and when almost everybody was in a state of blockade almost all the time. So whatever you got into them, they were willing to pay you the moon to buy it. But it was not a good cargo ship, uh, great for wartime. And then along comes a June afternoon in 1815 when the Duke of Wellington here in a black coat on a horse uh, at the Battle of Waterloo defeats Napoleon. And all of a sudden, for the first time in 25 years, the world is at peace and the seas are free. And you don't need Baltimore Clippers anymore, unfortunately. You don't need swift boats that don't carry much. You can have slow boats that carry a lot. And here is one of the first great slow boats carrying a lot. In 1819, a group of merchants in New York found a shipping line 
called the black ball line. And you'll see the black ball on a, the foretopsail there. Um, the, the black ball line was not just a shipping line, it was the first shipping line. These merchants said, we are going to send a ship to Liverpool from New York every Wednesday evening. And this was the first time in human history that anyone had ever published a schedule for when ships would sail. Before 1819, ships didn't sail until they were full. And sometimes it took months to fill them because there wasn't all that much stuff. But by 1819, a group of merchants in New York bet that Americans could grow enough to fill a ship every week. And they bet that the British could make enough to fill a ship coming back every week. Did they win their bet? They sure did. The Black Ball Line began to sail in 1819, and it was still sailing in 1847 when this painting was painted. And it shows that a high volume trade had begun across the North Atlantic. A high volume of food going out, a high volume of manufactured goods coming in. And when ships arrived on the American side, the manufactured goods could make it cheaply out to the Midwest by the Erie Canal. And the same Erie Canal brought all of those Midwestern crops to the port of New York. And it is in the 1820s, after the canal opens in 1825, that New York becomes the biggest city in North America and lays the foundations for whatever it's been ever since. So we got to, we, our end of it for internal communications was the Erie Canal. The British did railroads. Here is the running of the first railroad in the world from Liverpool to Manchester in 1820 something, I forget what, seven. Um, and uh, so on both sides of the ocean, you had very different things. We had food, the British had manufactured goods. We had Ohio with wonderfully fertile soil and England had plows. So we bought English plows, plowed Ohio, sent wheat to England and kept it all going and going at a very high volume because the two countries also built their internal communications. By the 1820s, there was so much stuff flying around the North Atlantic world that it became possible and necessary to build giant complexes of docks and warehouses. These are the East India docks in London. These giant seagoing ships look like toys, giant five-story warehouses stretching on for half a mile. Uh, these no longer exist, but you can see they're runner up. These are the Albert docks in Liverpool. Liverpool built seven and a half miles of waterfront warehouses and enclosed docks to unload the things that we sent them and to load the things that they were sending us. Nothing like this was happening in Paris, Vienna and Rome. These Paris, Vienna and Rome were parts of balanced economies. Austria grew stuff, Austria made stuff. There wasn't a lot of trade across the ocean. England and America were profoundly unbalanced economies. We grew a lot of food and we made very few things. The English made many things and grew very little food. And it created a tremendous amount of transatlantic stuff moving. It took lots of ships to move it. And when the ships came in, it took lots of people to unload them. And it took lots of buildings to store all of the stuff that got unloaded. And it also took lots of buildings to store the stuff that was about to be loaded and sent back. This is South Street in New York in 1826. Those little houses across from, across from the ships started their lives as houses. But as you can see, they have signs on the second floor now. People have moved out. Why did they do that? Well, or how did they do that? And they were doing it here. Here is a fine example of it. This is our main street. This is Baltimore Street in 1850. 
and you will look and you'll see that the buildings that front on Baltimore Street in 1850, with the exception of that big Baltimore Museum and Gallery of Fine Arts, are all what we would think of as row houses. And they're row houses from the late 18th century, the very early 19th century. And when they were built, they were houses. Most of them had shops on the ground floor, but the shopkeeper lived upstairs. By 1850, most of these buildings have signs at the second floor level and signs at the third floor level. Nobody is living in these buildings anymore. Instead, people are storing and selling goods in all of these buildings. There is so much stuff that merchants move out. And by 1850, very, very few people are living in the center of Baltimore or in the center of London. Uh, this is happening all over the North Atlantic world. It's not happening anywhere else because nobody else has this volume of trade. And the old buildings in the center of Baltimore and London become a real problem. Here is a typical 18th century Baltimore house, which could be a typical 18th century house anywhere in uh, the North Atlantic world. Those dark lines are brick bearing walls and the openings in walls are windows. Before about 1840, 1850, every house had a lot of brick walls because something had to hold up, hold the wall, hold the thing together. And every room needed to have a window because artificial light was terrible. The candles did, were, you couldn't work by them, you couldn't store things by them. What this means is that buildings covered a very low percentage of their lot. Um, a building like this covers only about, ha, has what they would call a floor area ratio, of maybe one and a half. That is to say that you've got one and a half square feet of building for every square foot of lot. And that was not enough to hold all the stuff that was going from one side of the Atlantic to the other. Around in the 1840s, three inventions come together that make it possible for downtowns to hold a great deal more stuff. The first is gas lighting. And all of a sudden you can have rooms without windows. The second is structural cast iron. And all of a sudden you can have buildings without brick walls that get in the way. You can have big open floor plans like this. This is not modern architecture. This is the 1850s at work for you. This is structural cast iron. You can store a lot of stuff in a place like this. Um, and the third invention, whoops, 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 whoops. The third invention is steam engines that are small enough to run freight elevators in relatively small warehouse buildings. Steam engines went through the kind of evolution that computers are going through in our lifetime, like Moore's Law. They started out gigantic, but by about 1850, they were small enough to be used to run freight elevators in relatively small buildings like this. And when you put these three inventions together, gas lighting, structural iron, and steam powered freight elevators, you get the possibility of creating a revolutionary new kind of building. And here are good examples of them. This is the 400 block of West Baltimore Street. You might look at these and don't, they don't look very revolutionary to you. What's revolutionary about them? Well, I wish I had an aerial photo of them. That would make it clear. These buildings cover 100% of their lot. They have windows at the front and the back, but they don't have windows in the side. And when you get into them, they have cast iron supports, not brick supports, and you can move stuff from one end to the other uh, with just a dolly. Uh, these buildings have an FAR of four. They have four square feet of building for every square foot of lot. They can hold two and a half times as much stuff as an older building could have. Very useful. But the 19th century isn't through with us yet. If you want to see a transition, here's the main street of Manchester in England in about 1825. See those pretty three-story buildings, four-story buildings. By 1880, it looks like this. this. This is going on all through the 
North Atlantic world in the 19th century. Buildings are getting bigger to hold all of these, all of this stuff. And they're not plain buildings either. Manchester is the biggest 19th century downtown that has survived. The American downtowns either burnt down or got torn down for skyscrapers. London got bombed by the Luftwaffe. Manchester was the second biggest city in England and it didn't get bombed by the Luftwaffe. And a lot of it is still there. This is an 1856 warehouse in Manchester. It looks like an Italian palace and you can put an awful lot of stuff in that building. Uh, and these warehouses are not calm. A big Victorian downtown on either side of the ocean is a Victorian place. And the architecture is very busy. It is very rhetorical. It's often medieval or Renaissance. It is often over the top elaborate. Um, I once in one day walked the downtowns of Manchester, Leeds and Newcastle upon Tyne. And by the end, I just felt that I had been listening to too many motivational speeches. These are very, these buildings are in your face. Um, and elaborately and very expensively decorated. This is all stone cutting. All of this is done by hand. This is an 1868 warehouse in Manchester. It's dated. Don't have to be an architectural historian to date it. Does the work for you. Uh, England was much richer than we were in the 1850s and 60s. And you could see it in their buildings. All the same, Americans wanted to be able to build fancy buildings too, even though we weren't rich enough to pay all the stone cutters to do this. How did we do it? We did it by figuring out how to mass produce mainly Italian Renaissance ornament in cast iron. Here is the first iron building in the world. Uh, the prototype for every steel framed skyscraper in the world. It stood in Baltimore at the corner of Baltimore and South Streets. It was the building of the Baltimore Sun. It burned in the Great Fire of 1904. It is hands down the most important building that we Baltimoreans have ever built, uh, the precursor of every building that has shaped a downtown since then. And the cast iron revolution triggered a complete rebuilding of the center of Baltimore. Here again, Baltimore Street in 1850. By 1860, most of those little buildings are gone, replaced with giant iron fronts like this. Uh, most of them went in the Great Fire of 1904. As I remember the book on Baltimore iron fronts, there are still 25 buildings that have some structural iron. The best museum of iron fronts is Soho in New York, if you want to know what it's like. Um, then there was another thing. Wait a minute. As the 19th century began to move more stuff around, somebody had to keep track of it all. And in, in addition to needing large rooms full of stuff, you needed large rooms full of clerks and accountants. Where were all of these people supposed to work? Uh, they also wound up working in downtowns and a new kind of building arose for them, the office building. There were no office buildings in the world in 1800. And by 1900, every building had. Them. Here is the transition of Wall Street in New York from about 1840 in this picture. And I'll ask you to look at Trinity Church in the background. As you can see the spire of Trinity Church in the 1840s is about twice as tall as every building on Wall Street, right? Okay, fast forward to about 1880. I can get this to turn. Come on, Davy, you can do it. My computer is freezing up. There you go. Here is this is not 1880, forgive me, this is 1860. These are big iron fronted buildings. Uh, you'll see that Trinity Church is still taller than they are, but not a lot. This one, whoops, ah, forget it, I forgot my slide. Here is the next thing that happens. Uh, remember those little steam engines that were running freight elevators? They were just freight elevators, they weren't elevators for people. Why not? Because if the rope broke, the elevator would fall and any people would be killed. 
Here is a guy named Elisha Otis solving that problem. If you've ever ridden on an Otis elevator, you may think that Otis invented the elevator. The ancient Romans had elevators. Otis didn't invent the elevator. Otis invented the safety catch on the elevator. And this picture shows Otis showing off his invention. He has had somebody haul him up 20 feet above the floor of the New York Crystal Palace. And then if you look at the top of the picture, you'll see a workman in a white shirt. That workman has just cut the rope that held Elisha Otis in his elevator. The elevator fell about an inch, the safety catch caught, and everybody down on the floor said, oh my heaven, look at this. And all of a sudden it became possible not just to haul goods up into the top of a building, but to haul people up into the top of a building. And by 1880, Wall Street in Manhattan looks like this. You now have buildings that are as tall as the spire of Trinity Church. And then by 1930, you have steel frames and you have buildings that dwarf Trinity Church. This is happening in New York. It's happening in Baltimore, Philadelphia, Boston. It's happening in all the North Atlantic cities, one way or another. The North Atlantic cities have invented downtown. One of the stories in, that I uncovered in figuring out what these cities have done over the last 400 years. Um, there are lots of other stories. Um, and if you want to know what they are, you can read the book or ask me back to talk. But thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Johns. I'm out. All right. Th thank, uh, thank you, Charlie. Let me, um, well, uh, I guess maybe you want to shut, uh, I just keep that screen up, but let me invite uh, everybody who's still with us to put a question for Charlie in the Q&A box. Um, and uh, we will uh, hopefully get rolling. Um, we've gotten a number of folks in the chat box say uh, thank you, Charlie. So uh, maybe we'll we'll, screen, we'll take a screen shot of those, and you can uh, you can read through Good. them. Well, let me get out of sharing so we can all see this stuff. Uh, okay, Good. excellent. Yeah. Um, so let me um, while uh, while uh, we're waiting for other folks to uh, type as fast as they can do it with their single digit typing like mine into the Q and A box. <laughs> so uh, you talked about. Let me ask one quick question. Um, you know, cities like Lond London and New York and Baltimore got downtowns, and cities like Paris and Berlin didn't. But how about when Paris and Berlin started to industrialize? Didn't they then have that same sort of trade imbalance that would require store origin people and whatever? Why, why does Paris still kind of not have a downtown? Uh, because it never acquired that trade imbalance. Uh, because um, as the European cities began to industrialize, um, they mainly made for the home market. They didn't export as much as the British did. Um, and they were always able to feed themselves from within their own boundaries. Uh, the French and the Germans have not imported a lot by, of food by sea. The Germans imported a lot of food by rail from Russia or by, but, uh, but they've always been much more self-sufficient than the English were in the Americans. And the English and the Americans are much more self-sufficient now than they used to be. It, you know, America industrialized after the Civil War, and that really changed the way ports work. Port, being a port was much more important before the Civil War than it was after the Civil War, uh, because America just wasn't making much before the Civil War, and then the war came along and we had to make everything and we got into the habit. Um, but um, so, you know, the imbalance didn't last forever, but it did last long enough to shape cities. Interesting. All right. Uh, um, I, I've spent four days talking about this stuff with Charlie, so I can spend four days now on this Zoom call. <laughs> if, if nobody else has a question to put in there, then, uh, then you all might be subject to a repeat of our uh, our whirlwind tour. I saw um, Jeff Lanou just did what looked like asking a question. Uh, okay, awesome. Yeah, the uh, question is, uh, uh, is, uh, is British soil that bad? Um, just crazy to think it essential to get wheat across the pond. Also, the wheat didn't get wet, question mark? <laughs> <laughs> uh, British soil is great. England is one of the most fertile countries in the world. The only problem with it is that it isn't very big. Um, by 1900, England had 45 million people and it's about the size of New York State. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
you know, by the middle of the 19th century, it was unable to feed itself. Um, and uh, you had big political fights over whether what kind of grain could be imported to England. Um, but always England is the center of international trade where you can send something over to England and the British will then send it somewhere else. Uh, much of what Baltimore shipped out, much of the food that Baltimore shipped out went to South America. And in return, the ships brought coffee and guano. I don't know what the wheat tasted like if it went out in a ship that had been shipping guano. But, uh, and, uh, and then uh, much, of the, much of the wheat that came into New York through the Erie Canal uh, was shipped to New England because New England industrialized before the rest of the country did. And New England is not a very good agricultural area. So all those New England factory workers had to eat Midwestern wheat and eat Midwestern corn, and they did. Um, so, excellent. All right, we got two two more here, and we we will try to be cognizant of the time and not not take up four days here. Uh, but we do have a question: uh, Could you compare and contrast the East Coast cities to other U.S. cities? I guess why are downtown East Coast downtowns uh, different than maybe Midwest or West Coast downtowns? Uh, East Coast and Midwestern downtowns are very similar to each other. Um, the cities are different. Once you get into the residential neighborhoods, a Midwestern city is a bunch of freestanding houses and an East Coast city is a bunch of row houses and they're very different. But the downtowns are very similar and they're similar because they were created by the same processes. Uh, between 1800 and 1850, a city like Baltimore was where agricultural products got exchanged for manufactured goods. By 1880, the East Coast cities of the United States are manufacturing cities. And so cities like Cincinnati and Minneapolis are doing what Baltimore was doing in 1820. That's where you know, Cincinnati and Minneapolis are collecting agricultural products and trading them for manufactured goods, but the manufactured goods aren't coming from England anymore. They're coming from Baltimore and Philadelphia and New York. So the processes that create East Coast downtowns uh, continue in the Midwest uh, and in the West and produce very similar places. Uh, it, unless you know, you know, unless you've traveled widely and love downtowns and have a really good visual memory, um, it's hard to tell one American downtown from another. They are the most repetitive parts of American cities. Okay. All right. F final question, um, uh, and it's a forward-looking one. So uh, downtown Baltimore now has a large population living there. What does this portend for our future? Right. Uh, <laughs> the, um, you know, downtown as a, as a central business district, as a place where lots of people work and nobody lives, uh, is dead. Nobody wants to have downtowns like that anymore. Um, the model for an American downtown or a British downtown is no longer lower Manhattan. Now it's midtown Manhattan. Midtown Manhattan is where you've got a, a, a lot of density and, and a lot of a big mix of uses. I think this is a fine thing. I'm all for it. Um, downtown Baltimore has changed drastically roughly every 50 years since the city was founded. And the change that it's going through now is the change of going from being just a central business district to being a dense mixed use area. Uh, if I ruled the world, um, I would create a development corporation to speed up the transition of downtown Baltimore. It's not happening fast enough and that worries me a little bit. Uh, there are good models, including uh, the nonprofit corporation that Baltimore created in the 1950s to build Gerald Center in the Inner Harbor. Um, but we, you know, down, it, it, all downtowns are changing. I, a New York friend of mine tells me that lower Manhattan around Wall Street now has 67,000 residents. Um, and I have walked around the city of London near the Bank of England on a Sunday afternoon, and it feels like being in a busy urban area. You've got stores that are open and shoppers. And I can remember when the city of London on a Sunday afternoon uh, was a place where you could lie down in the middle of the road. 
Um, not anymore. There are tens of thousands of people living there. Big change, uh, good change. Uh, Baltimore is making that change too. I want us to make it faster. Uh, if any of you are wondering, gee, is there any one thing we could do? The answer is yes, tear down the arena to connect the east half of downtown with the west half of downtown. Uh, the arena blocks that connection. Downtown Baltimore is one dead arena away from greatness. I, I, I'm not sure that we could end on a better note than that, Jared. That was, uh, I think that's called a mic drop. Is that right? <laughs> Fine. Let's All drop right. that mic. <laughs> right. thank, thank you, everybody. We are going to end it there. Um, hope you have a good rest of your afternoon and uh, check us out next week for Patterson Park. All right. Thanks again, Charlie. Patterson Park. Hooray.